You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. Romans chapter 8. Get back onto the whole uh, New Covenant topic. <clears throat> the uh, all about that grace. <laughs> all about that grace. About that grace. More grace today. All right, a grace sermon. Radical grace. I'm a believer in it. So Romans eight one. We know this. I always talk about it. We quote it all the time. Right. Therefore, or there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's as far as we'll get right now. We'll have a lot of other scripture to look at, okay? But the majority, the majority of people today who think that they are they are saved or and or going to heaven, okay? I'm gonna mention that a couple of times. They they think they are because of something they do. Well, we sort of gone over this though already, right? The works thing and righteousness and all this, but it because of something they do or they don't do, and humanity it seems or men think that they can earn their way into heaven. Okay, but we have seen that our salvation is totally of grace. Now I'll say this: of heaven or salvation and or heaven. The reason why I say it mainly is really what we're talking about is our salvation, okay? Eternal life, going to heaven is just the, like the bonus. It's the added free gift, eternal life is, right? You're not going to find a sermon in the New Testament and Acts about like, hey, turn or burn, get saved. You need to get saved so you know you're going to go to heaven. Uh, our, our strategy for, for preaching over the, you know, the years has usually been like that. You see the tracks, you know? Yeah, or whatever, or even the church signs. If you were to die right now, where would you go? <clears throat> Not going to say that's all totally wrong, but the point. The, my point is, uh, the apostles weren't like, "Hey, do y'all know where you're going to go when you die? Heaven or hell? You should repent." They're, they didn't preach that. They, it's just not there. That's the 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 end reward, the eternal life part. Okay, uh, going to heaven. It's your salvation takes place when you're saved and it's about your relationship with the father now right so you have your whole life however long you have from the time you get saved until you go into eternity to to have a a, a relationship with with the father with the son with the holy spirit and with others that's why we gather right so it's not all about heaven i just want to make that clear right so we, we know we are not under condemnation of God any longer, nor will we ever be because of we, what? Jesus, right? Being in Christ. So I want to make some things clear about this verse because we could get the wrong ideal from reading it, okay? Because many have interpreted the verse to mean that we are not condemned as long as you're doing something right and you're always on the good side of God, Okay? So we have to ask, is that what, it, is that what it's saying? Is, a, is condemnation or the lack of it based on how you live? Because if it is, then what we know and understand about God's grace is wrong. So I want us to look at this because I think many base their relationship with God, God upon their performance. Okay, So there's some repeating when we do these sermons like this. But I think it's necessary. It's good to have repetition. Because there's always a lot of questions. All right, so <clears throat> those people who are performance-based or works-based, they think that as long as they live right, right, you know, in quotations, if they live right, 
All right, then that's some sort of a certain way that God is not going to condemn them. If that's true, then our relationship with God is based upon works and not grace. All right. Okay, so the theme of condemnation, you can find it throughout throughout scriptures. Okay, so John 3.16, we know that verse, right? We know John 3.16. All right, well, we'll just take a look uh, uh, at it, uh, go a little further than 16. But it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. All right. So now we've gone over a few weeks ago, the great contrast, okay, of the old versus the new, which is Jesus. And here we see eternal life, which is salvation here, contrasted to condemnation. Those who believe in Christ are not condemned, but the person who does not believe in Christ is right. So the word for condemnation that Paul uses in Romans is only used three times in Scripture by Paul in Romans. He uses it twice in chapter 5. Uh, in Romans 5, 16, in this whole part, he's Adam versus, and Jesus. Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus. We spent two or three weeks on this before, uh, on that part in Romans when we were going over the gospel. But 516 in Romans says, And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Okay, So Adam's sin resulted in judgment. And this, this Greek here is a sentence. Okay, The sentence from the judge resulted in condemnation. Uh, this punishment, it's a punishment that's follow, following the sentence. And in the and all this Greek stuff, I know sometimes you're, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but it's not likely to refer to the sentence as an edict from the judge. The, the, the emphasis is the judgment. All right. So what was the condemnation that Adam received? All right. He, death. But he didn't die physically that day, right? He died spiritually. He became separated from God, who is life. God, you know, truth, life, all these things. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, Jesus is life, God's life, right? To be separated from him is death. So to, to die physically in the state or condition of your spiritual death is to experience the second death, I believe, which is eternal death, all right? Condemnation is spiritual death. It results in the second death. This is eternal death. You're dead for forever. All right, so Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men, right? Okay, in this verse, we see the same idea. Judgment results in condemnation or punishment. This one man's offense, okay? Adam's sin, when, all right? This is what's going on. He sinned as this federal head, a federal representative for all humanity, right? Adam's sin, then it goes on to the account of every individual in Adam's race. So you and I, as being represented by Adam, participated in Adam's sin. In this section in Romans 5, is that comparison that's going on. Adam, Jesus, Adam, Jesus, right? The comparison is very simple, though it's very theologically profound but there are two men who each performed a single act that brought forth a single result 
And the result is experienced by every member then in their respective races. Okay? I don't mean the different races that we have or, or know, know that we have now. I mean the race of Adam, the race of Christ. Okay? In Adam, all are condemned. But in Christ, all are made righteous. All men are born in Adam. And it's only by grace, through faith. It's okay. Things happen. See, your microphone probably heard me say something and it turned something off. Because it's spying on you. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. All right. The two respective races, Adam and Christ. Okay. In Adam, all are condemned. But in Christ, all are made righteous. All men are born in Adam. It's only by grace through faith that we are placed then in Jesus. Right. So we'll go back to Romans 8. 1. There is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Does anybody have a, a, a translation where verse 1 continues? No? Everyone just goes to two, uh, verse 2 for the law of the Spirit? Okay. <clears throat> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why I asked that. This text teaches us there's no condemnation, no punishment, no separation from God. There's no eternal death to those who are in Christ. Okay, Christians are no longer of Adam or in Adam and will therefore not receive punishment for Adam's sin. We are now in Christ and have received his righteousness. Okay, there's other translations, though, that verse one continues. Okay, so depending on what translation you use, you may get a different idea then of what uh, uh, or of who it is that has no condemnation. Okay, the New King James says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And the same in Young's. It's like that uh, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the 20 minutes of, of Greek stuff and, and manuscripts and the history of the scrolls and all that, but a very large majority of the manuscripts contains the phrase, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. All right. Now, I believe Scripture teaches our, our justification is unconditional. So, and, and I don't know why ESV and others leave that part out. Uh, but uh, it may be because of the way maybe I see it. It seems to be a qualifying phrase, does it not? All right? <laughs> All right, so I am sure then, if you're like me, you would admit that if not being condemned is based upon your daily walk, then you're probably in trouble a lot of times. <laughs> or you think you are, right? All right. But the better manuscripts and the scrolls say this. It seems to issue a qualifying statement. There's no condemnation as long as you, right, walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What, so what's that mean, right? The, that phrase is not, it's not qualifying, it's descriptive, okay? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. A Christian is one who does not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the problem then is, what's the understanding of this phrase? What is it, right? Because most of us, I think we would define walking after the flesh is doing sinful things, all right? I didn't have time to give you a whole lesson on the, the word flesh and the whole, in the 80s, NIV, mis, mistranslated, a Greek word, sarx, put flesh, and this now... The result is most of us, we go flesh, we think of out, of out of Christ, it's sin all the time, right? It's largely due to the mistranslation of the NIV in the early 80s when it came out. <laughs> so, I uh, don't have time to explain all that, but there's different versions, variations, different uses of the word flesh. It doesn't always, when we say flesh, it doesn't always have to mean sin, okay? Okay. Uh, so it doesn't always mean walking according after, uh, walking according to the flesh does not have to mean doing sinful things. And I will explain that. That's what this sermon is about. Uh, so it, we need to understand how Paul uses the words. Okay, so Romans 8.8. 8, 
It says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So is Paul talking uh, here about Christians who are doing sinful things? Or is he talking to unbelievers here? Because that's a huge difference. And I know Christians, we love chapter 8 of Romans. (laughs) Right? We love it. Yeah. Because it's very edifying. It's great. So let's see how Paul uses this, okay, uh, other places. Look at Galatians 4. And there's this whole, this whole chunk in Galatians 4, and, oh, it's just really good. I did, I did an episode on the podcast about it, like cast that bond woman out of there. Um, but he, he's, here Paul is speaking of births, okay, the births of Ishmael and Isaac. Okay, so Galatians 4, 23, it says, But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. While the son of the free woman was born through promise. What's going on there? Right? Ishmael had fleshly parents who were Hagar and Abraham, right? But Isaac also had fleshly parents, right? Sarah and Abraham. So Paul uses flesh here in a sense that's other than just biological, right? Uh, They are they they were both born of physical parents, right? In a physical birth. So what does he mean that Ishmael was born after the flesh? Anyone know? You can try to answer if you want. uh, If you keep reading, verse 29, it says, But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. When you take these two verses and they're viewed together, you start to see that Paul is saying that Isaac was born by promise. He, by promise, according to the Spirit. Ishmael was not born by promise of the Holy Spirit, right? Ishmael was born only after the flesh. So the word flesh is, is not just a biological process, but it doesn't necessarily mean doing sinful things either. Biologically speaking, both of them, Ishmael and Isaac, were born after the flesh. But spiritually speaking, only Ishmael was born after the flesh. All right, so it is in that spiritual sense that Paul uses the word or used the word flesh in Romans 8, 8, okay? Um, And... and, uh, the extra ver- the extra part of of one that most of us don't have uh, being born after the flesh or after the spirit does not refer to a difference in physicalness of birth right I mean that that should be obviously it doesn't mean doing sinful things either per, per se it, it, you have to be careful here on this but two 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 opposing principles in their birth. Right? Trust. that These are trust in what is humanly possible as opposed to in God's grace, in his promise, in what he said was going to be possible. If you guys know the story, right? You guys know the story. Okay. Couldn't wait. Go have a kid. Go sleep with the, the bond servant. All right. Now, in Galatians, Paul's purpose, and it's, oh, it's just really good, but that whole allegory then is of the two covenants. These two covenants was to show that God's promise to Israel through Christ, right, could not be received in the old covenant age. Jews under the law were the children of the flesh, who were of the bondwoman, the old covenant, as typified, right, we talk about types of shadows, by Hagar. The Old Covenant could not give freedom by reason of the weakness of the flesh. Now, if you read that section in Galatians, you imagine Paul telling Jews, like, they were like, we're descendants of Abraham. And he's like, nah. (laughs) It doesn't matter if you're physically descendants of of Abraham. He starts saying, you guys are children of Hagar. You imagine that, that would have been like, that's like a smack in the face. He was like, no, you guys are of her. Cast her out of here. Why? Because what's superior now? Jesus, right? See how that's all fitting? So it's a really good part, actually, in Galatians 4. 
All right, so that weakness of the flesh, okay? It was, it was given, this law, all this, okay? It was given uh, by God to show the inadequacy of man to live according uh, to human possibility. Oh, <laughs> couldn't see him. <laughs> so in Paul's view, flesh and spirit fall into redemptive historical categories, okay? Serving to make clear this contrasting natures of two covenant ages. Seeking to live by law then really boils down to seeking life independently of God, which was the basic sin of what happened with Adam and Eve. Right to walk after the flesh is to seek life in terms of what you can accomplish in yourself. Right? Doesn't have to mean sin. It's what you are trying to do to accomplish on your own and your strength and your mind and your will and all that. Okay. Now Galatians six seven eight. It says, "Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap." For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So if we take flesh here to refer to a sinful life, then sowing to the Spirit would mean living a holy life. And this would mean that everlasting life is a product of living right. And that would be salvation by works. All right? <laughs> And salvation is not of works. Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So what Paul is saying in the Galatians 6 part is that when a man seeks to gain the gift of God by human possibility, then that very act itself is sin because it bears the fruit of self-righteousness. Right? The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. All right? The very act is sin because it bears fruits of self-righteousness. You cannot earn a right standing with God by what you do. Not happening, right? We've gone over this. It's because of Christ. Justification is by grace and grace alone, right? Philippians 3 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision. Believers, we are the circumcision, right? To walk after the flesh is to seek to be right with God in your own strength. That results in condemnation. The Jews placed all their confidence in the flesh. They were physical descendants of Abraham. They had the mark of circumcision. They physically performed the ceremonies. And they outwardly did the duties and the traditions of the law. But... It was all of the flesh and it got them nowhere. To place one's confidence in anything that's outside of the grace of God that's been offered is to have confidence then in flesh, in yourself. To walk in the Spirit is to trust in Christ and His finished work in, in the reason that He's seated. The finished work on Calvary. Walking in the Spirit is depending on grace and grace alone. Right? And then chapter or verse 2 of Romans 8 then gives the reason for no condemnation when walking in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Right? The law of sin and death. Paul contrasts two laws. The law of the Spirit is the same as back in Romans 6, 7, where it says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. So through the death of Christ, we become dead to the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death was the old covenant law. And look at what Paul says about this old covenant in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 3. Uh, there's a lot to turn on if you're trying to keep up. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. <laughs> this is good. If there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. The old covenant was a letter that killed, but the Spirit gives life. The old covenant was a ministration of condemnation, but the new covenant is a ministration of righteousness. And go back to Romans 8 now. 3 and 4. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness, okay, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The law could not produce God's righteousness, it says. It wasn't the law's fault even, though. It wasn't, okay? The problem was the flesh. What the law couldn't do, then God did. Jesus comes, and he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. And tell me again that Jesus was just a man. Here we go. Likeness. The likeness of sinful flesh. Likeness means, in the Greek, similar but different. <laughs> So he was not just a man, all right? He was God too, all right? The difference was he wasn't sinful, right? And then it says, uh, for he in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. For sin means a sin offering. And then he condemned sin, so he judged against. And then the sentence was passed and executed on sin in Christ's flesh. And then for states the purpose for which God condemns sin in the flesh. It says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice that it doesn't say that we might fulfill the law, but that it might be fulfilled in us. We're passive. God is uh, the actor here. God is active. The requirement of the law is fulfilled in us by God. And what is it that the law required? Righteousness. Righteousness is the state of him who is such as he ought to be, which is right with the Father. Righteousness expresses the relationship of being right into which God puts the man, right? The man who believes in him. So we can never be right with God through our own works, the deeds, and our own efforts, our own strength. Not happening. We can only be right with God through His grace. Jesus took our sin, bore it upon the cross. He paid that sin debt. He took our sin. He gave us His righteousness. All right? So believers, you are believers today. You have to know you will never be punished because you have the righteousness of Christ. So when you hear somebody say, well, they're getting on to you, they're exhorting you, they're rebuking you, but the Bible says there's no condemnation. Yeah, but they don't know grace. They're not grasping grace. We are as righteous as Christ is righteous. We stand complete in him 
Christians have died with Christ. They've been raised with Christ. So walking after the flesh was not a problem that was only faced in the first century because many today are walking after the flesh because they're trying to gain a favor with God by their works and what they do. And it doesn't matter if it's doing your good deed for the day or prayer meetings, Bible studies, all these types of things. They think, oh, this is good. I need to do this. I need to do more and all this type of stuff. They're walking after the flesh. They're trying to please God by the things that they do. That's walking after the flesh, okay? And walking after the flesh is to be condemned, it says. If you are trusting in something that you have done to earn your salvation or to make it better, you're never going to get it. To walk after the Spirit is to trust in Christ and in Christ alone. And to trust in Christ alone is to receive the righteousness of God It never faces punishment. No condemnation. God's righteousness is a gift of grace. Right? We knew we couldn't earn it or deserve it. It's only by grace that you and I are given the righteousness of Jesus. And so we stand before the Father, before God, perfectly righteous, blameless and holy, totally obedient in His sight. So if you are trusting to any degree at all in your own morality or your religious attainments, or if you believe that God will somehow recognize any of the good things or good works that you do as merit toward your salvation, then you need to seriously consider your Christianity and what it is. And that's not being mean, just saying it's not understood. Because there is no condemnation to you or to us or anyone who are in Christ. God has made us righteous. He has made us accepted in the beloved. And we will never suffer his wrath. We will never face his punishment or his judgment because Christ has taken care of that. And this is part of grace. This is what grace is about. Any questions, comments, disagreements? 